preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good morning. Thank you all for getting up at this bright and early hour. Um, it's starting to get dark now, very early, and it was the middle of the night when my alarm rang. Well, welcome to the 92nd Street Y. My name is Deborah Nadell McGee. I am the director of the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning right here at the Y. And this is our season opener of our partnership with Barnes & Noble in our Books and Breakfast series. We feature extraordinary people discussing contemporary life, values, and ideas. Our upcoming breakfasts will be with Gore Vidal in conversation with his biographer, Fred Kaplan, on Tuesday, November 9th, again at 7.30 in the morning, and Andy Rooney in conversation with Peter Osnos on Thursday, December 2nd. So please join us on those days. Today's guest author, Marion Wright Edelman, will be talking with Parade Magazine's editor-in-chief, Walter Anderson, about her latest book, Lanterns, a memoir of mentors, which pays tribute to the mentors who have in influenced her life choices. Marion Wright Edelman is considered the most influential children's advocate in the country. She's the author of the bestseller, The Measure of Our Success, and has set an incredible example for all of us who are interested in the welfare of children. Following the discussion, we will take questions from the audience, that's you, and at the end of the program, Ms. Edelman will be signing books in the hall directly outside of this room. For now, would you please join me in welcoming Marion Wright Edelman and Walter Anderson. Thank you. Hi, Marion. Hi, Walter. Good morning. Good morning. Why don't we begin by describing the role that your parents played as your mentors? Well, I feel very lucky to have had such great parents. Um, Howard Thurman, the great black theologian, wrote a piece in one of his books about an old oak tree in his backyard that he would watch every day and watch as the seasons changed. And he was struck that that tree had leaves that turned yellow, but all went along remained on the tree. Um, not sleet, not snow, not hail could make these leaves fall from that tree. And then came spring, and he, the leaves would fall off naturally. And underneath them would be buds. And he said, you know, I began to understand that the function of the tree and of the leaves was to protect the growing edge so that the, the new buds and the new spring could come. And I think about that tree when I think about my parents, who um, always put us first, hung on to us through thick and thin until we could all develop. Um, and I think about certain qualities when I think about my parents, integrity. Um, faith, family rituals, um, sound choices. I tell a story about how my brother Harry, who's a minister in Brooklyn now, came home for one Christmas holidays with a great big social schedule, and he was upset that Daddy had let the car run down. Um, and had a, you know, he wanted to be proud on his dates. And he also, while he was at it, told Daddy that his clothes were getting a little thin and his shoes needed replacing. And my father looked at him and said, my credit is good, and I can go and buy another car tomorrow, and I could buy a new suit, and I could get new shoes, but your tuition is due in January, and I can't do both. So I think I'll simply drive this car a little more to get it tuned up and half sold my shoes. But they really were people of faith who tried to live that faith in action. Whenever they saw a need, they tried to respond. Um, there are no homes for the aged and for the blacks in my home county, so my parents started one across the street for old Reverend Reddick, who had Alzheimer's, I now know, and no family. So we all learned how to cook and clean and see that everybody was our neighbor. So I learned caring because they were caring, but the point was they always put their children first. And you will see a lot of my daddy's sermon excerpts 
in this book because he thought that you should keep a home together no matter what. He said, when romance leaves, settle for duty, but children need stable, mm. stable homes. In Bennettsville, South Carolina, there was a boy who stepped on a nail. And because he could not or did not receive care, he died. What did you learn from that experience? I learned about the sadness and the unnecessary tragedy of children not getting basic health care. And a lot of the reasons I do what I do today is because of little Johnny Harrington and the experiences that I had in Bennettsville. He, he needed a tetanus shot. Um, and children today all over the world need tetanus shots and they need immunizations. And in New York City, almost half of your preschool children were not immunized until we mounted a campaign to change that in this city. But for a child to die in this country for, because of a nail and because his grandmother did not know and did not have the money, they did not have health insurance, and the fact that there are 11.3 million children uninsured in this rich nation that leads the world in health technology, 700,000 of them here in New York City and state, which we're trying to change, is a disgrace. What does it mean to be number one in the world and yet cannot see that your children, all of them, get health care? So I hope one of the big issues in next year's campaign will be making everybody make a commitment to say that every child, 90% of whom live in working families who do not have health coverage will get it, and every parent and every American too. I would think that the richest nation on earth would make that commitment to its people. Still in Bennettsville, one day there was a traffic accident. An ambulance raced to the scene. But when the ambulance driver got out, he realized that the only injured people were black. So he got back into the ambulance and he drove away. There are many ways that your father and mother could have responded to the situation of Bennettsville, South Carolina in the 30s and 40s. Uh, but how did they respond to that, and what did you gain from that experience? God was always outrage. But then Daddy and Mama always tried to figure out how can we figure out how to change this. Mm -hmm. And they made clear that the segregation in the South was wrong. They also made clear that it was key to get an education, but then to get an education in order to come back and make the changes that needed to be made. Um, and you know, we didn't have a playground for white, for black children in our hometown. So they began one behind the church. Um, but the emphasis always is on, is on, if you don't like the way the world is, you know, you go out and find a way to change it, but the adults in our lives struggle very hard to give us the tools and to struggle with us to change it. So we never despaired because we always had that hope that while things may be bad today, you are empowered to do something about it tomorrow. Okay. What can we learn from children? Oh, we can learn a whole lot from children. Um, I think many of us know that in the Talmud, someone said that, that They'd learn very much from their teachers, but they'd learn even more from their students. And I did a chapter in this book on children as mentors, and that was a surprising chapter. I hadn't planned to write it. It kind of came out. Because we treat our children as if they're citizens in waiting. In fact, you know, children are active people, and I was active with the adults in our childhood. And one of the things I think we need to realize is what a debt we owe children for the transformation of this country in the 60s. Um, it was children who stood up to the police dogs and to the fire hoses in Birmingham when adults were often afraid to do that and the movement for Dr. King with Dr. King had stalled. It was children um, who lost their lives in the, in the 16th Street Baptist Church. You will see pictures in this book of children in Jackson, Mississippi standing up to police billy clubs and being hauled off in cattle haulers because they wanted to change the way segregation functioned in Mississippi. It was little Ruby Bridges who walked through the crowds and stood every day and prayed for them, amazingly, um, but who sat in those classrooms by herself day in and day out. And so the sacrifice of children really was a key point in transforming racial segregation and discrimination. And we need to empower children today. One of the remarkable things, I don't know if you know, this book got started because a diary, an old journal, showed up on my desk about two and a half years ago. 
in the mail at CDF that I had left in the chaplain's house at Yale. Bill Coffin, William Sloan Coffin was the chaplain then, and I had left this in his basement, and the new chaplain's wife couldn't read my writing, so she put it in a box, didn't throw it out, took it to Trumbull College, and you know, some years later decided to try to discern what this, new, this diary said as they were about to move again. And it turned out to be such a gift of memories because it was a diary of my senior year at Spelman College, and it shows how it felt to be 19 and 20, to be caught up in the civil rights movement, to be engaging in sit-ins, but how, again, adult mentors like Dr. King and Dr. Benjamin E. Mays and my favorite professor, Howard Zinn, um, and Whitney Young was then dean of the School of Social Work, but how we were engaged in changing racial segregation and discrimination in the South, how smart we were, how strategic we were, a little piece of paper with a diagram for the sit-in movement in all nine places were laid out in this little, this little journal. But the point is that young people need to understand that they can be partners and leaders and catalysts for change. And Taylor Branch said that um, never, has the transformation of a great nation turned on the moral witness of children? And the real question facing us today is whether this nation can now pay back its children for their sacrifice in the 60s in helping change segregation, and obviously played a great role in the Vietnam War demonstrations, um, by, by investing and protecting in what is a voteless, lobbyist constituency, and it is the real test of democracy. But we understand, we have to understand that our children have contributed and continue to contribute to our daily life. It could be argued that at the beginning of the 20th century, the two greatest social problems were race relations and the unequal distribution of capital and resources. We're now at the beginning of the 21st century, and it could be argued that the two greatest social problems are race relations and the unequal distribution of capital and resources. That is not to say there has not been affected, there have been gains in some of those areas. But uh, as a, another mentor of mine taught me, I never know what another human being thinks or feels or means. I only know what they do, and they are their behavior. That's Elie Wiesel. And uh, I ask you this because of you were the first black woman accepted into the Mississippi Bar Association. And one of the early actions you took was to introduce man who became one of your mentors and is described in Lanton's, Robert Kennedy. Would you recall that experience for us? Robert Kennedy came to Mississippi um, with Senator Joe Clark's subcommittee on poverty to look at how the poverty program was working and I was very concerned about protecting Head Start because Senator Stennis and others, the state of Mississippi had refused to take the Head Start program. Um, and so community groups and religious groups applied and we were able to get the money and we ran one of the largest Head Start program in the nation for about 13,000 children and Senator Stennis and Eastland got very upset, held up the entire appropriations for the Office of Economic Opportunity, but Senator Javits invited me to come up and testify and out of that I said come to Mississippi and see for yourself how Head Start and the poverty program is working and they did and Robert Kennedy came with them. And while I had intended to testify about Head Start, I ended up testifying about hunger because hunger had become widespread in the aftermath of the summer project of 1964 where hundreds of white college students had joined students, black students from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, that had stirred up a lot of violence and it also stirred up a lot of retaliations. Um, people were being pushed off their plantations without any skills, without any place to go, without any income. Um, a lot of violence is continuing. And they had then at the state level decided they were gonna stop distributing free commodities and turn over the program to food stamps and they charged $2 for a family of four for food stamps. And there were people in Mississippi with no income and so hunger and starvation was beginning to take place. And so I described this in the hearing. 
And I asked Robert Kennedy and the senators to please come up into the Mississippi Delta and to see for themselves. And Robert Kennedy came, and because Robert Kennedy came, the press came, and I was very moved by him because he went through the houses of many poor people, talked to them about what they'd had for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner, and the answer was often nothing. He ran into, went into a house in Cleveland, Mississippi, which was the single most moving experience, and we passed through this almost lightless kitchen without television cameras. There was a baby sitting in a corner on a mud floor with a bloated belly, and he sat there and he poked and he tried to get a response out of that child, and he just became outraged and said he just had no idea that there was poverty like this in America. And he went to other houses, but he went back to Washington the next day and he promised he was gonna do something. And he went to see Orville Freeman with my husband now, Peter Edelman, who was his legislative assistant who had come to Mississippi with him, and told Orville just to get the food down there, but Orville Freeman did not believe that there were people in Mississippi and in America that had no income. So he sent Peter Edelman back down with the bureaucrats from the Department of Agriculture, and they went back through the same houses to see the same people in the same empty ice boxes or cupboards, and um, changed the food stamp cost. But then that set into place a series of events because he became a passionate advocate to end hunger. He got 60 Minutes to do a, an exposure on children in America, hungry children in America, that aired after his death, but which had a dramatic impact. He got doctors to go around the country with the Field Foundation here in New York, to, and Bob Coles was among them, to document hunger. Um, later, the McGovern Committee held hearings on hunger and malnutrition all around the country, but the upshot was that in the 70s, doing the Nixon administration, we had the largest expansion in child and family nutrition programs, and hunger was virtually eliminated. The food stamp program today serves over 20 million people, many of them working, a majority of them children, and I tell you, it's outrageous to see hunger come back in the 80s because of the Reagan policies and continue in the 90s. Hunger is not an act of God. It is a set of political choices of men and women, and we need to change it. This whole thing about ending welfare as we know it, and we all want to end welfare, you need to put something better in place, and we have not ended poverty as we know it. And Second Harvest reports now increased demands on their food pantries and homeless shelters and Catholic charities are reporting again more hunger in families. And so I hope next year we will demand of every one of our political candidates that they commit to ending poverty. There are 13 and a half million poor children in America. 70% of them live in families that work, and while a lot of people have left welfare, they're getting jobs that don't lift them out of poverty. They're not being told by their state agencies they're still, if they work, able to get food stamps. Um, and so we need as a nation at our booming era, of, in our booming era of prosperity and with all the wealth to say we're not going to let children go hungry in America or be poor in America. So Robert Kennedy would be very sad to see all that progress dribble away in the misguided choices of this nation. Among the Lantons that you describe in Lantons is Rosa Parks. Why Rosa Parks? Oh, she was one of those great women. Um, and I describe a lot of great women, and I've always had great women in my life um, who just got tired and sat down, and she was the right symbol at the right time. A lot of people had sat down in the South before Mrs. Parks, but the time wasn't quite ripe. Um, but one of the things that I love to say thank you is to all those quiet women, great women like Mrs. Parks, um, who just day in and day out try to stand for the right thing and to stand up for children. This book is dedicated to three unlettered women, Miss Lucy and Miss Kate and Miss T. Kelly, whose picture, Miss T. Kelly's picture's in here, who treated children as their own, and they knew instinctively what Walker Percy said, and that is that you can get all A's and still flunk life. But Miss, Miss, Mar Miss Parks had gone to Highlander, um, but you know, sitting down made her up, made, Dr. King stand up. It made the whole community stand up. But one of the key things is that it always kind of takes one person to finally say, I'm going to do, do what's right. And out of Mrs. Parks and her previous life of integrity, the whole community rallied around 
Dr. King found his voice, but there was also E.B. Nixon. I think it's always important to know that there are people who had been there planning and waiting for the right moment and the right person to symbolize the movement that they wanted to spark. And so you've got to have that infrastructure in place. But I talk about two other great women, which Mrs. Parks also gave ode to, Ella Baker, who if she had not been around, Dr. King probably wouldn't have gotten around to organizing the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because she understood that he couldn't just respond to events, that he had to have an infrastructure between him and then behind him. And then there was September Clark, who understood that if you were going to get the vote, which the Civil Rights Movement was trying very hard to get, that you had to teach people the literacy so that they could read and write and overcome the obstacles to registering to vote. So these two enormously important women, one set up the infrastructure of organization that supported Dr. King over the years, and the other created the idea for the citizenship schools to train poor, illiterate people to be able to vote. And women, in many ways, were the backbone of the civil rights movement. But Mrs. Parks was the symbol, and that was important. You know, Moses came down and said, I got great news for everybody. God just told me how we can live a good life. He gave me 10 things that we can do, and I'm going to share them with you. And he was all excited, and they were called the commandments. And if we would just live this way, we'd have a great life. And he was very excited about that. Well, of course, that's been interpreted different ways over the, over the years since then. But I notice you give us 25 lessons. Uh, God gave Moses 10, and you give us 25. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about uh, a couple of these and just ask you to ex express them. And this is just select selected at odd order. Call things by their right names. What does that mean? There is so much hypocrisy in America today, and I think that the single biggest thing that's confusing so many children is that we adults say one thing and do another, and they look at what we do and not what we say, and with our advertising culture that is designed to make us want things we don't need and to make them as obsolete as quickly as they can so we'll go out and buy more. Um, but you know, we, 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 we use words as much to hide the truth as to reflect the truth. And one of the things I'm so grateful for in the people in my life is that they were who they seemed and said what they meant and they meant what they said. Um, but you know, I give some examples here. You know, Mike McCurry, whom I happen to like, but he called the welfare, the erosion of the welfare safety net when Mr. Clinton did not veto it, as a little trimming around the edge. Well, the, the safety net was destroyed. We called the MS missile a peacemaker. Well, it's not a peacemaker. It's just something that's designed to kill millions of people. Um, and so we need to learn how to speak the truth again and to, and to stop this, this confusion that really makes our children children um, not want to be like many of us when they grow up. It's a sad thing that we live in a time when we really don't want our children to grow up to be like many of the leaders in the media and in political life and in private sector life, and we tend to lead segmented lives. We think we can be people of faith on one day a week and then go do our business as usual, which often is not so honest, um, the rest of the week. So we should speak the truth. We want our children to be honest and to have integrity, we've got to have it. And that's not present in too many institutions and in too many places of power today. When you were describing Rosa Parks before, I could have used the same description in, des in describing you. Someone wiser than I once said that all great revolutions, all great change, the greatest change in all civilizations begin as uh, one thought in one person's brain. You uh, created the most uh, significant movement for children and the Children's Defense Fund had enormous success with that, yet then you created a Stand for Children. So I'm going to refer to Lesson 8, watch out for success, it can be more dangerous than failure. Well, you got to keep at it. You don't stand on yesterday's laurels, you don't park on what you did over the last 20 years. Mm. The point is to keep alive and stay on the creative edge. I guess one of the things that's important is recognizing that all of us, I feel, 
as I'm an, I'm an instrument. I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. here to create a children's defense fund to create a children's defense fund. We're here mm -hmm. to talk about how do we make this country put children first, and we've got a long way to go. We've made a lot of progress, and our wonderful New York office, um, you know, has worked to bring coalitions about that has increased the immunization rates by, you know, enormous amounts. Now at 80 percent, they were at 50 percent three years ago. We've got a plan that if we can get everybody mobilized, that could provide health coverage for 700,000 children out of Stanford Children. Came a new child health insurance program that can serve up to five million children, but we've got to get them enrolled. It doesn't do enough. You know, to say you win something by standing for children in 1997, you get a new law, but if parents don't know about the new law, if the state bureaucratic obstacles haven't been changed, children are not going to be helped. And so we've got wonderful now rhetorical attention to children and a lot of incremental gains that I'm very impressed and proud of that have helped millions of children. But the bottom line is 11 million children are uninsured, 13 and a half million children are poor. We've got a gun violence epidemic that goes on in this country that takes a child's life every two hours from gunfire. We have got to change that. And we've got budget priorities that continue to favor the rich at the expense of the poor. And in this post-Cold War era, without a lot of thoughtful analysis, we're talking about building new Star Wars systems um, when children can't get a decent education or are not ready for school. And so we have got to fundamentally change the priorities of the nation. Um, and so I'm so glad that everybody thinks CDF has done a good job over the last 25 years. The most important years are those ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And we've got to work hard to transform the nation and make its children come first. Lesson 13, God has a job for all of us to do. Open up the envelope of your soul and try to discern the Creator's orders inside. Well, Mr. Kierkegaard said that a long time ago, but Ms. May Bertha Carter in Mississippi, who is one of the mentors that I describe, who never had any theological training, came to that conclusion on her own. She had such incredible courage. Ms. May Bertha lived in the same county, Sunflower County, which was Senator Eastland's home county. Um, that was one of the most dangerous counties in the world. She and Ms. Hamer stood up at a place where I would never like to be after dark. I would make a big point of getting out of Sunflower before dark, but they never left. And Ms. Carter exercised her freedom of choice that she thought she had, put her children, the last eight of them, in the all-white school, and as a result, they got their home shot in, they got evicted from their house, they couldn't get a job anywhere, and they put those children through that, that that school, um, and every day she would say how she'd wait at the end of school to the school bus to come and she'd count her children as they would come through and she would then say prayers together with them, hear their day, hear about the heckling, but teach them not to hate. Someone asked her whether she would do that again, and she said, absolutely, I would do that again, that the suffering was worth it because without an education, um, you wouldn't be able, my children wouldn't be able to get out of the cotton fields like I was. But she also said she got her courage because she really had faith that believed that inside of us, God gives each of us something to do and has a good purpose for it. Um, and that was her purpose in life, was to get her children a better education and to make sure that other children had a chance. And so she and Mr. Kierkegaard really had the same theology. He came at it in a linear way, but she came at it out of the experience of her life. Travel lightly through life and resist the tyranny of burdensome or unneeded things. Oh, how many of us aren't going crazy, and then that includes me, because of all these things I have to take care of. Um, and we keep buying more and more books that we don't have a chance to read. Not this morning, you buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I subscribe to more magazines than I can read. I mean, there's so much clutter. And we are told in this materialistic culture that we've got to have more and more and more things in order to be successful. And one of the great shifts that I can, am so concerned about is the shift from what I was taught in my childhood that what was important was intrinsic. I, that my father and mother and the elders didn't believe in derivative power. They believed in the power of each individual that came from God and that what the outside world said was not what defined you. And that is a message we're going to have to try to retranslate today because the message that our children get 
Is it self-worth and worth comes from having things or having power or being violent and being able to make the other guy lose at your expense at, 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 and you win? And so I think that um, we really do have to look and see how we can simplify our lives, but more important, Having things is fine. I mean, all of us like nice things. All of us like beauty and need beauty. But the real issue is whether we're giving our children something deeper, the spiritual anchors to struggle and to understand that um, what goes on in the outside world, whether it's violence or whatever, that we have a way of taking care of ourselves and deciding not to be a part of that. I mean, you look at Mr. Gandhi, who was no more perfect than many of us. Um, I was just reading a new book on him yesterday on the, on the way here, and how he struggled with all the things we struggle with every day about being violent and trying to become like the British and wanting to have nice things, but how he just finally began to become a very different, disciplined person. And it leaves us hope, those of us of faith, that we can always become better, but we need to focus on those things that are truly important and begin to counter the need of our children to have all of these things. You know, you tell them on television and on movies that they've got to have designer sneakers and clothes, and then we don't give them the education and skills to buy them legally. And so therefore, they mm -hmm. begin to get into, into trouble and buying them illegally. Um, but what are our messages? How do we get back to something bigger? Don't ever give up on life. It is God's gift. When trouble comes, hang in. Harriet Beecher Stowe once said that when you get to your wits in, hang in, because that's where God lives. Um, I really do believe that, and I worry so much about how many people give up. But I also worry about the presence of guns, because gun suicides is one of the largest problems in the war that many of our children face. We lose a child to gun violence every two hours, but I went back and looked since Dr. King and Martin Luther King were killed, how many Americans had died from violence? And the number between 1968 and 1979 was 1 1.4 million. About 950,000 people had died from guns, and over half of those were gun suicides. Um, and 92% of those gun suicides were white. Black gun suicides among young people, young men, is going up, but white youth are six times more likely to commit suicide. And I think there was a piece in the paper yesterday with mm -hmm. David Satcher pointing out how many suicides we're finding with guns. Guns lethalize despair. But what does it say about the absence of faith or of purpose in family and in community that so many people take their own lives. And so many children give up because adults are not giving them hope. They're not saying we can change things. And I just hope, and I tell stories to young people all the time about the people who made it. And one of the things I really hope that this book will do will be to show how ordinary people changed extraordinary problems. And I like to tell about our new mayor who was born about 49 years ago in Los Angeles to a teenage mother um, who couldn't keep him. So she placed him in foster care. The foster mother didn't pay any attention to him. For three and a half years, he didn't speak, lay on one side, had to have corrected surgery. Um, and they began to think he was retarded. Um, and a neighbor watched this child and somehow felt that there was more there than, than what appeared and nagged a na another neighbor to think about adopting him. Well, the father in the family says, we can't afford to adopt another child. We've got two. Your, my wife is pregnant with a third. But the mother said, well, I think we can find room for another child. And he said, well, we can do it only if you can get the money to go through this adoption process. And Mrs. Williams, who was a singer, got a little bit part in Porgy and Bess, sang long enough just to get the money to adopt um, this baby. They took him in, never had spoken, loved him back to life. They ended up adopting and having more children and added up to eight or nine kids in that family. And Anthony Williams, after a lot of rough patches from this rough beginning. He's got himself through high school, went on to Yale College, went to Harvard Law School, went to the Kennedy School of Government, and is now the mayor of the District of Columbia. And I watch children who are beating the odds every year. And so you just have to tell children about stories, tell them they can make it, but more important, let them know that there are a whole lot of adults out here who are struggling to build a movement so that all of them can make it. 
up until the end of that story, I was starting to think, gee, I've never saw Rudy Giuliani like that before. <laughs> <laughs> it's the tradition of these uh, breakfasts that the breakfast guests get an opportunity to ask the distinguished author questions. And we're now at that time Thank during goodness. the breakfast. If you would raise your hands. Huh? Yes, sir. A couple of questions. Uh, what are your remembrances of Fannie Lou Hamer? And the other is, how have your two sons carried on the tradition of your, your father? My three sons. Um, <laughs> that's right. Um, Mrs. Hamer, I have a chapter on here. She was a great inspiration. I loved and respected Miss Hamer, who always told the truth. Um, and there's this moving story of Miss Hamer when she first got arrested in Winona, Mississippi, and got very badly beaten by her jailer, but who reminded and w reached out to the jailer's wife, quoting scriptures about how God made all people of one blood, but how after she'd had her worst beating and there were some younger people from SNCC in the same jail, terrified to death, but she came back in her cell and she just began to sing. And the other young people hearing her sing began to sing. She was always challenging preachers as well as black preachers, whom she called chicken-eating preachers who didn't believe in their faith enough to get out and act, um, as well as everybody around her to act on her faith. And I talk about how she came to Atlantic City and tried to get the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party seated. And she met with, with um, Hubert Humphrey and Walter Bondale, who had been sent to get them to accept a symbolic compromise of two voters. And she said she didn't promise her local people that they were going to accept this thing. And so she said no. Um, but she was genuinely upset and not understanding how Hubert Humphrey could think that him getting a seat on the vice presidential ticket was more important than the lives of 400,000 blacks. She did not try to be politically correct. She always tried to say what was right. So she was a great woman, and you will see a wonderful picture of Mrs. Hamer in here at the, at the what I, we called our Jewish christening of our first child, Joshua, when she came and she sang and she stood um, with us as we dedicated our first child to God. I'm very proud of my children. Um, our oldest boy, Joshua, um, Joshua Robert, who's named after Robert Kennedy, um, is a teacher, and I try to get everybody to go out and teach. I'm trying to keep everybody out of law school. I wouldn't go to law school today. <laughs> um, but we need to go teach. Children need young people to, who have high expectations and who have energy. But he teaches at Menlo Atherton High School and runs a wonderful youth development program with a mentoring component um, for 25 boys from East Palo Alto. And I tell you, he works harder than I do. My son Jonah um, runs Stand for Children, which is an affiliate organization where the 200,000 and Walter came, came to Washington, and then we followed that up with Stand for Children every year locally in all 50 states. Out of that Stand for Children 1997 with the National Coalition came the new $48 billion child health program. We stood for children child care in 1998, but we all got sidetracked by the personal political events that went on in Washington. But we will be standing for children every year until this nation does what is right. Our baby is trying so hard to stay out of the family business. He's very good. He lives here in New York City and is producing films for the winner for the. Olympics every other Saturday on NBC. Um, he worked for CBS, but we'll get him. He comes. He's watching. Um, he's watching his brothers closely. He's 24 um, and loves New York City, but is a very nice young man. And I often tell a story. Um, and he helps. Pe I mean, he's he's he he works in his own little way, but he looks at his brothers and is trying to hold out um, as long as he can. But they all know about their father. They all go back home, grandfather. Um, and I think that Tim and I watch my nieces and nephews, um, all of whom understand that the family business is service. Um, and so, in many ways, I don't care what they choose to be in their lives, as long as they understand that they've got to give back. So we have said to Esther, if he ever ends up making a lot of money, then he's got to support the rest of us who never will. <laughs> so we'll see. In the back.
Well, I really need, I've got my vice chair, Maureen Cogan, here, and many of our New York City offices here. Um, we've done a knot already in New York City. The immunization rates four years ago for preschool children was hovering around 50%. They're now over 80% working thanks to the New York City office, doing a lot of the quiet technical work of stopping the whole huge, you almost have to have a law degree to get through your Medicaid or your child health forms. And so we've been trying to streamline. Oh, I see Leslie, another board member here. How are you? Um, but the New York City office for the last seven years has worked quietly to begin to try to streamline and make it easier for children and families to get health care. Out of the last two years of negotiations, one has gotten now a new child health insurance program. They worked with, with, with the city health department, with Governor Pataki, um, and, the, and Dennis Rivera from 1199, who's another board member, and they, um, we've been able to achieve a new health program that will serve cover all 700,000 children, and we've just launched a massive public education campaign with Martha Stewart Living, with Kmart, are holding health fairs, was a wonderful health fair at the Children's Museum. Um, but we're trying now to let parents who are working and others know that this is available to help them work through the application process. We've trained a number of community, Columbia um, University students to work with community providers to help people get through the bureaucratic burden. So one of our goals is to see that every New York City and state child has a healthy start and gets health care. We are going to be holding our national conference here in New York next March 25th, 28th, so we'll use this as an advertisement. We will be looking at education. We will be looking at how we can all mobilize a movement for children. But right now, the key goal is seeing that every American, every child in this city and state gets health care. And we will make sure that every candidate for political office on all sides of the aisle are asked what they intend to do in specific ways to leave no child behind and to see that every one of our children gets a decent education, gets safe from violence. And so I hope everybody will join with us in trying to hold our political leaders accountable. And I hope you will join with our New York office, call them up, and see a range of specific things that they are doing. But we are very excited about what has been accomplished. But more importantly now, we'd like to build on the immunization success and see that all 700,000 New York state and city children actually get health care. New York, in some ways, has become like the symbol in the Mississippi in the 60s. We say we can do it in New York, we can do it everywhere. Mm -hmm. and because there are so many children here having an effect and showing that we know and can learn how to reach all parents and to get them health care, because without good health care, they're not going to do well in school. If a kid can't see, doesn't have hearing aids, they're not going to learn well. But so that's the first issue where we want to show, like in immunizations, concrete successes, then build for that. But we're concerned about quality child care, education, violence, but with health as the lead issue. Yes. Defining clear needs that need to be addressed. Um, doing your homework and analysis very carefully. She was saying she's trying to, st you want to stand up and say it again, she's trying to start a new nonprofit health education organization and she wanted to know how to make sure she's successful. I think the first thing is making sure you're responding to a very real and specific need. I'm doing careful homework and analysis, mm -hmm. figuring out who can do something about the problem, and then going out to educate people about it and what they can do and sticking with it. I mean, I think that being a good advocate is like being a good pest. You just have to hang in for a very long time. I had the illusion 25, 30 years ago that if you just told people the truth, they'd do what was right. Well, that lasted about a day. Um, and, you know, we've done hundreds of reports and did all of our homework of analysis, but you've got to mobilize a constituency and you've got to endure. You've got to make it harder for them not to do what you want to do than for them to ignore you. And so that's why I think we're at a stage in the children's movement, even though we've made a lot of significant incremental successes, where we've got to now catapult children 
to a very different level so that we can compete with the military budget, so that we can compete with corporate welfare, and so that people will think it's unthinkable that they will erode safety nets or deny children health care. And that's going to require a whole lot of citizens being well-educated but being determined. I mean, what has happened to us that the killing of children has become routine? I think we're not going to change that until a whole lot of people <clears throat> get as outraged as Robert Kennedy and Dr. King were about poverty and about the denial of basic needs. And mothers and grandmothers particularly standing up and saying, we're going to just stop it. And we're going to have to have the equivalent of mothers against drunk driving. In fact, it's going to have to be a whole lot stronger than mothers against drunk drivers because they didn't have the NRA on the other side. So we're going to have to build a movement for children. And that's the next phase. And I think the last thing I think that is important is that while one does the massive communication, and it's so hard to communicate today, with our fragmented media structure and the preoccupation with so many things um, and with advertising is so hard. I'd long for the good old days when there were three networks and Dr. King could be seen on all and the Birmingham dogs could be seen on on all. It's so hard now in this 10 second culture to get a message and to deal with complexity and the problems are complex, but they can be dealt with and we face a media that doesn't see good news as news and that makes people people lose hope. But we've got to train leaders, a critical mass of leaders, to be informed. And then secondly, massive public education outreach. And third, massive mobilization of a grassroots constituency and stand for children was the first step in doing that. But we have got to go many more steps. And everybody has got to get involved in their congregations, um, in their clubs. And so I'm so glad that you're thinking about finding your way. But then it's important that you join together with other people working on health and other people working on Head Start and on child care and education so that we can all come together in a unified way to provide that powerful united voice for children we're going to have to have to move the political process along. In the back. Well, school violence is one symptom of the broader glorification of violence in this society and the proliferation of guns in this society and the breakdown of adult connections with children in this society. Um, and there's no single solution. We have lost 80,000 American children to gun violence since 1979. That's more than we lost them in battle casualties in the whole Vietnam War. I think we've got to do four or five things. School is really the safest place children can be despite the spate of violent killings. Most children are killed in their homes, and most gun deaths occur with people who know each other, and guns are a very big part of that. So the first thing we must say is that we must make sure we take steps to keep children safe at school, but it's the safest place they can be. It's a less than 10 percent, of, in fact, far less than 10 percent of all the gun deaths that kill 4,208 children, um, according to the latest data. A child every two hours, a classroom full every two days. First message is around guns. We have 200,000 guns in circulation. Make and produce another one every eight seconds. A kid can go and get a gun sometimes easier than they can check a book out of the library. Parents need to know that you keep a gun in the house that that greatly endangers your children. We talk about suicides. Many of those suicides are associated with homicides. And again, most gun deaths occur in households between people who know each other. Don't keep a gun in the house. And if you really have to keep a gun in the house, make sure it's locked, unloaded with the ammunition someplace else, but we've got an enormous public education job to do to help people understand the dangers to counter the NRA myth that you need a gun in order to be safe from intruders. The second thing is we need to improve the technology on guns and personalize them to make them child proof. And third, we've got to regulate the most dangerous consumer product. I mean, five-year-old children walking to school with loaded guns and assault weapons and handguns that have nothing to do with hunting. This is the only unregulated consumer product in America. We regulate toy guns and teddy bears and don't do this. We're going to have to have a movement to stop it. Third, kids need to have something to do after school and on weekends 
Um, and in the summer months, they need to be engaged with adults. We were kept so busy, we didn't have time to get into trouble. And the whole community was watching mm -hmm. to make sure we were not doing things that we weren't supposed to be doing. The gun dealers and the gang dealers and the drug dealers are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How many of our community institutions are open? How much interaction is there with adults? Third, we've got to deal with the glorification of violence through the media, on the internet, um, but, you know, children see violence everywhere. I just met with the high school class at Wilson last week, and they just felt that violence is everywhere. They don't feel safe, even though they have not had incidents in their school over the last couple of years. In their neighborhoods, they feel they've got to band together with each other in gangs and to protect each other because guns and drugs are everywhere. What does that say about the adult society that has left it to children to figure out ways of banding together because they think they're going to be killed and the reality is real as you look at the numbers? And last on school violence, I think if, if schools speak up about tolerance, I mean, what went on in Littleton and in Columbine was something that is a pattern that had been going on a long time of separating out kids, of the jocks, of the geeks. Um, you know, we have got to make sure that there's a respect and a tolerance for each other um, and demand that and model that in our institutions. We need to step in and promote peer mediation and conflict resolution. We need to instill a sense of values to our example as adults that make sure that all children feel respected and loved and that no group of children is valued more than another. And the fact is, in this country, we do tend to value athletes more than others. We do tend to say to middle class white kids, you're more valuable than black kids and brown kids or poor kids and disabled kids. And so that sense of the sacredness of each child and of adults showing that this is important and reflecting that in their daily lives. And I tell people who work for children, don't go into it unless you can love and respect every child. So there was something wrong in the atmosphere there um, in that school. And we need to lastly make sure that schools are educating children. Because children who feel good about themselves because they're learning and because they have adults around them who respect them and who model nonviolent ways of relating to each other, tend not to be so violent. So if we can take the virus of guns and make it less accessible, um, and then have adults who model nonviolence, but the fact is we live in a country, whether from our military budget, to our permissiveness about guns, to the ways in which we transmit to our children through our culture and through our lives, domestic violence and child abuse, that violence is the way we resolve disputes, that they get that message. And so we've got to have a new ethic of nonviolence and find new ways of relating to each other. And the school killings and killings of children generally are going to continue until we confront this crazy insanity of guns everywhere and confront the need to find another way. But violence is a value that our children hear us affirming every day. And enough of us have got to find a way to say, no, there's another way. And that's what Dr. King's life was about. Whenever I'm in a room with you, I always leave inspired to go out and do something. I want to go out and do something Good. now. But I want to close with your lesson 25 possessions and powers don't make the man or woman principles characters and love do you live your principles my friend thank you for being here this thank morning you for having me. thanks for listening for more information on the 92nd street y new york and all of our programs please visit us at 92ny.org